I'm so excited to be here today. I want to, as Pastor Peter was talking, I was like, yeah, I'm so excited for just what I get to see across the world. Um, so you guys know we've given already a million dollars to missions by September of this year, and then God put on our hearts to give an additional million in a time where everybody's like, hey, this thing's gone on for too long. We need to start coming back. I mean, maybe we should start hunkering down. The Lord told us, no, that's not what my people do. All of God's armor is forward facing. Everything we do is to advance the kingdom. And so God put on our hearts to give an additional million dollars to missions. We're about 700,000 of that. A person from, random guy from Indiana, uh, matched 300,000. And so we have an additional seven, eight, nine, ten, right? An additional 300,000 to go. There's a missionary in Iraq that is planting a cafe there that, that really like needs the money. I think that project is $50,000. And for that to, for that to happen, um, means that she gets a visa, her and her family get a visa. It means that they can employ Iraqis. It means that they can start giving out Bibles. It means that a place, I love the way Pastor Peter said it, in a place where hope is extinct, we can bring hope back with Jesus. It's awesome. A quick story about this missionary, just so you know the ups and downs, but God's good at the end. About this missionary, um, I kind of found out a roundabout way that she had thought. She went to a doctor in Iraq the doctor said, you have lumps in your breasts and you have breast cancer. Almost positive you have breast cancer. They didn't have the, they didn't have the tools to, to fully check, but they said you need to fly to Dubai and you need to have the check there. The, her missionary budget would cover one airline ticket. So she, made the, she was thinking, well, I'm going to fly and I'll leave my husband and my kids in Iraq while I go to potentially get a death sentence in uh, Dubai. We heard about that, and because of the generous givers of Mount Hope Church, we were able to say, no, we think your family should be together. We think your husband ought to fly with you. We think your kids ought to fly with you. And for less than $5,000, we were able to get four flights from, this is a miracle if you know flight costs in the Middle East, but from Baghdad to Dubai, we were able to get an Airbnb, connect them with Christians there. And the greatest thing, when she went in, they said, oh, I don't know what the doctor in Baghdad was talking about. You don't have cancer. Totally done. I fully believe the Lord took care of her practically, let her family be together, gave her peace, and healed her. And you and I got to be part of that. You may never meet her. We're trying to work ways to do mission trips to places like Iraq. So if you come with me, you could meet her. But you may never meet her this side of heaven. But I promise you, when you get to heaven, there's going to be a husband and some kids that come running to you saying, thank you. In one of the hardest times of my life, because of your giving, I got to be next to my wife and we got to see God do miracles. Now she goes back with that confidence to a place where hope didn't exist until she comes back and says, let me tell you about the healer. You and I got to be part of that. I was having a conversation uh, with a friend of mine and he got stuck in the doom and the gloom vortex. He was just, you know, the political blah, 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 and COVID blah, 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 and the way the world is blah, 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 and just the doom and the gloom and the gloom and the doom and the doom and the gloom, and just over and over and over all this stuff. And finally, I really felt like the Lord impressed upon me to interrupt him. And I said, "Um, so how's your soul? And a weight fell into the conversation And all the conviction of, I got my eyes on all these million different places. This guy's a good guy. He's a Christian. He loves the Lord. He knows the Lord loves him. But his compass was like spinning like this, and he didn't know which way was north. But when I asked him, how's your soul? He stopped, and he thought, we had a meaningful conversation about Jesus. I want to title today's message, How's Your Soul? So how's your soul? If you're watching online, I want to ask you directly, so how's your soul? You didn't come through this feed however you found it. It wasn't on accident. It was so the Holy Spirit could ask you, how's your soul? If you're watching downtown, you can give Pastor Javon a huge high five for me. He's amazing. But I want to ask you, how's your soul? If you're here in this room, I want to ask you, how's your soul? We find ourselves in a new season in America A season of great deception, division, and desperation. I know for many of us, this has been an incredibly busy season. As weeks turn into months, many of us are asking, how long can this go on? I'm not sure what your this is. 
Could be online schooling when you never signed up to be a homeschool mom. It could be all the closed stores and gyms and movie theaters that would normally give you a little bit of relief from your busy life. It could be pressures from work. It could be political divides in your family. Your this could be marital pressures, could be health issues. Maybe your this is just that when you're walking to the store, you stop and forget that you left your mask in the car and then you have to walk back and get your mask and then you have to go to the store. Maybe that's your this. Maybe your this is worrying about your at-risk loved ones. Maybe your this is not being able to open your business that you dreamed of running. Maybe your this is crushing isolation. Maybe your this is just the fact that everyone seems to be extra grumpy. 2020 has been full of challenges, opportunities, and pressures that would give even diamonds a run for their money. If we're honest, we're getting a little seasick from the ups and downs and the roaring waves of this year. So where's peace? I know peace is written behind me in two-foot letters, but where can I actually find it? If you stop for a moment, if you get your eyes off your own worries and you look around, you'll see a great deception. A great fog is covering our land. It feels as though the warm sun is setting and a night is setting in. The collective soul of humanity is growing colder. If you've been listening over this last year, you've heard those defending the act of slaughter that we call abortion use words like essential and life-sustaining. In 2020, we heard those that proclaim to promote peace and falsely say that they're about unity. We've heard those same people promoting, inciting, facilitating, and even in some cities funding riots, violence, and anarchy. Pornography and the objectification of women and children is commonplace. You and I drive past truck stop spas and swipe past porn advertising as if we, the church, are powerless to change anything about it. In this season, agencies focused on the care for abused children can only brace themselves for the wave of victims that will surely come as a result of not being checked on daily by teachers, coaches, and other community activities that have been canceled. Depression, anxiety, and trauma-related health issues are at a record high. Police friends of mine have said that in the past they would respond to one to two suicide calls a month, and now they respond to one to, su one to two suicide-related calls a day. I hear all of humanity in one voice asking the same question. Is peace possible? Is it even possible? Or is peace an old-fashioned word that went away with online bullying, super viruses, and race riots? John 14, 27. You can put that verse up there. I want you to feel the weight of this verse. We're not in some momentary blip on the radar. We know the world is on a collision course with hell if Jesus, through you and I, don't stop that. We know the world gets worse. We know that COVID and having to put a mask on and all these things are but a minor groaning compared to what the Bible has promised us in the end times. We know that there is a battle. We have armor that the Lord puts on us, and it's not so we can sit in fancy buildings and just let everybody else go to hell. God gives us some amazing weapons. He doesn't leave us out to dry. It's not up to us to build up our own strength. He gives us the weapon of peace. He gives us the fortress of peace. John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So in the last hour of his life, King Jesus is concerned that you and I would not be overrun by anxiety. Of all the things he could have talked about, of all the places he could have implored his disciples, hey, I need you to do this, I need you to do that. Will you, will you like rub my feet? Will you encourage me because I'm going to the cross? That's not what's on his heart. He's saying to us, I want to give you peace. The peace the Lord is talking about, it could be global peace. It could be world peace. It could be ethnic 
ethnic peace, geopolitical peace. It could be no more Hutus killing, killing Tutsis in Rwanda. It could be no more tribes in the Mesquite villages of Honduras killing each other. It could be no more Sunnis blowing up Shiites and Shiites blowing up Sunnis. He could be talking about that kind of peace. But he's not, it's not the, what's forefront out of his, of his mind as he's talking, and I know it's not because of what he says. If you look at the verse, you can put it back up there. It says, peace I leave you with. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. He's talking about our hearts. He's talking about peace for us. It's that personal. It brings me to the first point. Jesus cares about your heart. It's that simple. It's that personal. It's that profound. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. He says, son, daughter, don't let your heart be troubled. I want you to be fearless. I've given you power so that when the fire comes, you can stand. The peace that I'm going to give you is going to make you the rock, Peter. The peace that I'm going to give you is going to make it so you can walk on the waves and rescue the dead and dying. Peace I leave you with. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. God does not give peace like the world gives peace. He says, I don't give you peace as the world gives. So how does the world give peace? The world gives peace a million ways, right? Through health insurance and safety belts and bomb shelters and fidelity accounts, police officers. The world insulates us. All the things that might happen plays on your fear and says, hey, we can do this to mitigate this, and we can do that to mitigate this, and we can, we can, the world's peace looks like stay home and stay safe. And please don't mishear me. I I love the fact that I live in a free country where if an emergency happens, I can call 911, and I have a savings account, and I love that God's blessed me to work at a place that can give me benefits, and I have health insurance. I love that we have all these things and I wear a mask and I wear my seatbelt and I do the stuff that I'm supposed to do. But if you came to a church to have someone preach about masks and safety belts and savings accounts, you came to the wrong place because those things might touch your life. They may affect your life, but they will not touch your soul. They will not. They will not do anything for the peace of your soul. So how's your soul? Your life might be great from all, from all the surrounding areas. Growing up, my dad was the CEO of a steel company. My mom worked at an ER. They made lots of money. They fell in love when they were 19 years old. They got married. They moved from England to Canada. They had three handsome young boys. <laughs> had the storybook life. From the outside, everything was good. My dad was a deacon at the Anglican church. They saw our life and they thought my dad was good with money and so they asked him to be the treasurer of the church. And you guys know my story. In the middle of that, when I was 13 years old, I walked in on my mom trying to kill herself because there was a deficiency of peace because everything was the world's way. And when we had big bank accounts and everything good, everything was fine, but as soon as, that, as, soon as the storm comes, as soon as the cloud co- covers, that peace is fading. I want to invite Ray if you'll come up here, she's going to share a little bit of her story of how God asked her to trust. Would you guys give it up for Ray, amazing Mount Hope Leadership School student. She's awesome. Thank you, Pastor. Um, This year in January 2020, I decided to submit to God's plan and let him uproot me out of my environment where I was. Um, I was not spiritually sound, and I was definitely not where God was calling me. So... In March 21st, I found myself officially homeless, living in a motel, and hopeless. No hope. Um, I'm living in this motel, two dogs, 
And I'm like, God, I have let you uproot me. Here I am. You called me out of the boat. I'm grasping for your hand. What do I do? And I was remembering back before I moved into this motel. I was in my bedroom and literally standing in the bedroom, I felt Jesus' hand touch my right shoulder and he said, it's going to be okay. An instant peace just flowed through my body like no other. So I'm on my knees one morning. I'm like, God, the balance of my motel is running out, provided by um, the person who I was living with at the time. And I said, God, what do I do? I feel hopeless. And I don't know if I'm allowed to be mad at you, but I am because I don't know what to do. And he said, take your savings, which was all that I have left to survive at this motel. He said, take your savings, take 10% of it, and I want you to tithe it. I don't want to. This is, <laughs> this is my cushion. And he said, I'm your cushion. I'm your security. Yeah, come on. Not your bank account. I was like, okay. So I took my savings, all that I had left, and I took 10% of it, prayed for it, asked God to bless it, and tied it that first week. Nobody here really knew my situation yet. Um, I didn't really tell anyone yet, anyone that I knew. And there was one service. It ended, and before I had to go back to my motel room, I wanted to walk around, and I saw the giving wall. And I just looked at it for a second, and God said, go write a letter. I don't want to. I was just so wrapped up in shame and embarrassment mm. and pride. Um, and believe you me, God worked on that. So I got a letter, wrote it. I'm pretty sure I didn't leave my name on there. Um, maybe just my email in case they needed to contact me or anything. And I get a phone call from Katie Ganser. This was right after I tithed my first time um, from my savings. And Katie calls. She goes, hey, what's up with your situation? This and that. I was like, yeah, blah, blah, blah. How'd you know? Well, did you know that me and Pastor Jeff look at these? No, I did not. <laughs> Thank you, God, for that. Um, that week, God moved through the church, and Katie and Pastor Jeff came to my motel and provided another two weeks at the motel, right when that balance was ending. Mm -hmm. So I was like, thank you, God. <laughs> Praise him. Thank you, Father. And so I took my savings. I took 10% of it, started to tithe it. I said, this is for you, Lord. Um, and in those moments, he, his Holy Spirit brought Philippians 2, 1, the Passion Version. He said, sweetheart. Well, that's not in the scripture. Holy Spirit called me sweetheart. He says, sweetheart, look at how much encouragement you found in your relationship with the anointed one. You are filled to overflowing with his, um, his comforting love. And you have experienced a deepening friendship with the Holy Spirit and have felt his tender affection and mercy. So I'm tithing again. Again, I didn't want to tell anyone, but I'm running out of food. After I tithe, I get a call from my dad, who later finds out that I'm homeless in this motel. He says, hey, we have all this extra food in the pantry. Do you need it? Yes, please. Again and again, I tithe. And each week that I tithe, God was providing. And like I said, I didn't have much in my savings. So it's dwindling, it's dwindling, it's dwindling. I still haven't found a job. I still haven't found a home, but I can't get a home because I don't have a job, so I'm supposed to pay for the home. So I'm feeling hopeless again. I'm on my knees in worship, and I'm like, God, help me. And God liked to play this game called Wait to the Last Minute. <laughs> so I give my very last tithe to where it was almost in the negatives. And my bank is kind of mean. You know, when I'm in the negative, they like to charge me more. It's weird. So I gave my very last tithe, and I said, this is for you. That following Monday, just one day after my last tithe, I get a call from Kroger. Not only does Kroger offer me the job, they say, do you want to start today? I say, yes, please. <laughs> um, this was a four-month journey of not homelessness, but healing mm -hmm. and faith-building 
and trust and a whole lot of humility. Um, but now I have a job, I have a new home, and I live happily with peace Ooh. with my two dogs and God in my heart. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. God's so good. Did you hear one of my favorite things she just said? I was homeless, so I got on my knees and I was praising God. Like, where do you get that peace? Where, where's, how can you, like her savings account was drying up. She didn't have health insurance. She didn't have any of the world's versions of peace. But yet she still could have enough peace to say, you know what, I'm going to trust. I have a friend of mine, uh, one of the missionaries that we support, he lives in Sudan, or lived in Sudan, and one day uh, he was arrested by plain clothed, not no one with badges, but people that said that they were police officers, and they were actually, they just didn't want their names to be part of an international incident. So they arrested him, talked to him about how they were going to execute him, and put him in a Sudanese p- prison for 32 days. He said every single day he thought it was going to be his last day. Um, but he said, you know what? I had peace. I knew I was right where I was supposed to be because God was right beside me. They got out miraculously. A senator got involved. Mount Hope Church again. We got to be part of this. We got to see him reunited with his family. They came back to America. They went through counseling. And they, you know, I mean, not that you can ever, like, to say that you can put a time, okay, now he's all better. It would be foolish. But they went through all the things. And then I got to meet with them. You guys don't know, but last family Christmas, they were on our stage. We couldn't talk about it. They'd only been home for about three months. But we got to meet with them, and they said, we're going to go back. And now they're in another country in, in the Middle East. And I talked with the wife, and I said, you know, you don't owe anybody anything. Like, you've already reached hero status. You can go home, write your book, fly to, you know, wherever you think is comfortable, and just live there forever, and we'll all read your book. Like, you don't owe anybody anything. And she looked at me, and she said, How could we not continue to talk about God's goodness to people that don't know it? How do you have that level of peace? Peace is not ignorance. I'm here to tell you, peace is not standing in the rain and pretending it's all sunshine. That peace is not childish make-belief or denial. That's not Jesus' peace. Jesus' peace lets you look into the gates of hell. It gives you the ability to stand at the very gates of hell and look into the eyes of the devil and proclaim freedom, to proclaim freedom to the captive. When all hell is breaking out around you, you can say, you know what? I'm right where I belong because I'm a king's kid, because I've been given authority to fix this mess. That's the kind of peace. When you get the bad report, When you look at your savings account and it's dwindling, when everything seems to be falling apart, you can still say, it's good with my soul. That's the level of peace that Jesus gives us. Why would we forfeit for some cheap counterfeit peace from a number in a bank account or whatever else, having insurance or all these other things? Please don't mishear me. Those are good management of your life. But if that's all you do, it's horrible management of your soul. So how is your soul? Jesus' peace is power. It's an indicator of the immovable, untouchable, unbreakable foundation that we have in Jesus. I don't know what 2021 will hold. I don't pretend like I'm a fortune teller and I know what's going to happen. But I can tell you, I know very well the beautiful, nail-pierced hands that hold my future. I don't know what that future is, but I know whose powerful hands has that future. And so I can say I have peace. How is it that Daniel can be sleeping in the lion's den while the king is pacing in the palace? How is it that three young Jewish boys can look the king in the eye and say, you know what, I'm not even sure if God's going to save me from the fire. But even if he doesn't, I'm still not bowing to your idols. How can they have that level of peace? No control over their future. And yet they still give their lives to the Lord and still say it's him who, who my soul belongs to. How can Paul and his preaching partner be praising in the prison? How can that happen? How can they stand in the prison, shackled, beaten, all the things around? Are they like, hey, just ignore it. 
Just ignore it. Just ignore it. Just when I, when I ask you how you're doing, I know you're bleeding, and I know you're chained, and I know they might execute us, but let's just pretend we're not here, okay? Put your, put your eyes on, and I, I listened to a, a psycho babble psychologist person. My, my wife is studying trauma counseling, so please don't. There's, there's good parts of that. My wife will be like, you shouldn't. Anyway. But I listened to Dr. Phil or whoever the person on the media was that says, if I just imagine that I'm on a warm beach, the whips won't hurt as much. Is that what they were doing? No. Because that's worthless in that situation. You can't tell someone whose wife was just diagnosed with cancer. You can't tell someone whose child is laying in a casket. Hey, just imagine, just pretend. It doesn't work. But I am here to tell you, there is a peace that works. There is a powerful peace. And it comes from Jesus and Jesus alone. It comes from the blood-stained cross and the resurrected body of Jesus. How is it that Jesus, knowing all that lies before him, knowing everything, knowing how he created his own body, every nerve ending, every piece of pain that he's going to feel, and bigger than that, every piece of my sin and your sin that's going to be rested upon him, knowing all that is going to happen to him, how can he sit in the Garden of Gethsemane and still say, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours? Because there's a power in peace. You know, we talk about keys and secrets in the scripture, and I'm about to give you one. If you have something to write down, you can write it down. If you have taken notes, this will change your life. How is it that the Moravians, you hear these stories of Moravian missionaries, that they were trying to minister to slave traders, and they couldn't infiltrate the ranks of slave traders? Like, how do you become a slave trader, and then you can minister to other slave traders? Like, how do you do that? So they, they thought that was a bad option. So, you know, one day they said, you know what we'll do? We'll take our able, our, our strong boys and all of our men and we'll sign up to be slaves. We'll, we'll sell ourselves into slavery. You can go read the history. And women and children lined up on the banks and men and boys went off on slave ships. And you know what the women and the children were singing? Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb. As they let their sacrifice go. How is it that they can have that level of peace? The secret is that heart is something that you can take and something that you can lose. We have the ability, the Lord has given us the ability to take heart in horrible situations. Heart is always accessible for us. The king's heart, power and peace, is always accessible for us to take. And if we're not careful, we can lose it. John 16, 32 a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each of you to your own home. You will leave me alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Heart is something that you can take and something that you can lose. First Samuel seventeen thirty-two. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Heart is something that you can take and something that you can lose. Jeremiah 51, verse 46. Do not lose heart or be afraid. When rumors are heard in the land, one rumor comes this year and another next year, rumors of violence in the land and ruler against ruler, don't lose heart or be afraid. Heart is something that you can take or something you can lose. Matthew 9, 22, Jesus turned and saw her. Who's the her in this story? We would know her as the woman with the flow of blood. For 12 years, scholars pontificate about what that flow of blood might be, but what we know for sure is that she would have had to walk around for 12 years saying, I'm dirty, I'm dirty, I'm dirty, I'm dirty, I'm dirty. Everywhere she went, I'm dirty, I'm dirty. She would have to say the, Jew, the Hebrew word teme, 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 which means unclean, unclean, unclean. If we think a few months of social distancing is isolating, what about 12 years? 12 years when everybody else can do whatever they want. But you, if you even sit in the same chair as someone else, will be shamed. That chair will have to be burned. 12 years of isolation. And what does Jesus say to her? He says, take heart, daughter. Like, these are not empty words. This isn't a 
cat toy dangling like, hey, just cheer up. I know they're not empty words because the very next verse, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. There's power in us taking heart. King David said this about his enemies, that they all lose heart and come trembling out of their strongholds. It paints pictures in my mind that we have a stronghold of peace and confidence in the Lord, but we, we give it up. We lose heart and we come trembling out. Oh, I might, oh, I don't know if I, ah, uh, there's so much. Do you know how big this? Don't lose heart. Take heart, daughter. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Heart is something you can take and something you can lose. For 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1, therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Heart is something that you can take and something that you can lose. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Everyone say it with me. Heart is something you can take and something you can lose. Perhaps one of the greatest accounts in modern history that I've had the privilege of witnessing of someone who took heart, buried it deep down inside them, and confidently marched into the fire and said, whatever happens, happens, because I know the Lord is with me. I'm going to obey the Lord, and I'm not going to obey everybody else. Perhaps the greatest example of that that I know of is Ronnie and Anita Smith and their son. Ronnie Smith and I, when I was 17 years old, we got a job together at SNR Tent Rental. We worked together, we set up tents together. He was a good guy. He was the kind of guy that you'd be glad to have on your crew. He honored the Lord. He didn't preach all the time. He didn't get up in people's face. But you could tell he was a Christian. You could tell he loved God. He worked hard for the boss even when the boss wasn't there. He showed up on time. He stayed late when he needed to. He honored God. And that continued on when we went our separate ways. I went to go be a missionary in China and he went to go be a missionary in Libya. He met his wife, Anita. They had known each other through childhood, and they got married, and they had a son. And one day, as he was faithfully living out his call, doing exactly what the Lord had called him to do, he was walking on the streets of Benghazi, and a van pulled up, and they put a bag over his head, and they executed him. They murdered him in the middle of the street for no other crime other than the fact that he was a Christian and a missionary. They had so much. Anita had peace that I don't understand. When we were in China, we heard about this story. My wife and I did everything we could to watch the the craziness of news that surrounded that event because I remember my wife saying, I need to know that Anita is okay. I need to make sure, I need to see that Anita can make it. Anita had interview after interview after interview. Churches all over, everyone surrounded, wanted to do whatever they could to the story. I called Anita this last week and asked if I could share this story. She gave us permission to. There's an interview from one of the news stations that I want you to watch. Remember the American teacher who was shot and killed in Benghazi, Libya? Well, he will be laid to rest today in Austin, Texas. Ronnie Smith was gunned down two weeks ago today near the site of last year's deadly assault on the U.S. consulate. Now his widow is coming forward to talk about her husband's mission, and she has some surprising words for his attackers. Anna Werner has the story. Anita Smith and her husband Ronnie moved to Benghazi with their infant son on a journey of faith. Both wanted to help bring about peace. We knew beforehand that Libya is not safe. We still wanted to go somewhere where we wanted to bless the people. Did you feel like you were ever a target there? Over time, I really didn't feel unsafe. Um, Once we started really knowing our neighbors and them taking us into their homes and them loving us, it just was normal life. He taught chemistry to high school students at an international school. They made friends and adjusted to a new culture, even to the sounds of bombing at night. It was even a joke within the city among the Libyan people just saying, have you gotten used to the bombs or that sort of thing. So then it became more normal and more not scary. Looking back now, do you think the two of you were naive at all? 
Not at all. We, we knew before going into Libya that this was, that there was risk. We were doing this because we wanted to follow what God has for us, and that's to show the Libyan people his love and his forgiveness. The family had planned to return to America to spend the holidays with family and friends. Anita and son Hosea left in mid-November. Ronnie was to meet them a few weeks later. He never made it. On December 5th, gunmen in a car shot and killed Ronnie as he jogged on this street near the couple's home. What do you think you're going to miss the most about Ronnie? Just um, because we, it seems like we grew up together. He's just been daily in my life, all these years growing together. And just imagining the rest of life without him, it doesn't seem real. She says friends and neighbors in Benghazi, including her husband's high school students, have called to express their condolences. In return, she wrote an open letter to all Libyans. I hear people speaking with hate, anger, and blame over Ronnie's death, but that's not what Ronnie would want. Ronnie would want his death to be an opportunity for us to show one another love and forgiveness because that's what God has shown to us. And she included a message to her husband's killers who have yet to be captured. I love them and I, I forgive them and I have nothing against them. Anita Smith says she wants to make a return trip to Benghazi to visit friends and neighbors to mourn together. For CBS This Morning, Anna Werner, Austin, Texas. And she wants to go back. Yeah, um, and is offering them forgiveness, which is incredible. The commitment to stay and live and teach there with everything that has happened, extraordinary. Absolutely. Hey, Mount Hope Church, I'm Anita. And I'm Jose. And, and we, we want to let you know that peace is possible. How is it? How can, how can someone say peace is possible, living in a place where hope is extinct and their, their husband being murdered? How can two weeks after their husband is gunned down, she say, I forgive them? I I don't have anything against them because Jesus doesn't have it. How, how is that even? This is out of this world. This does not make sense. I'm here to tell you that peace is possible. That level of peace is reality. It's not, it's not a fairy tale. She didn't say, oh, my husband's on vacation. He's not really dead. Looking it right in the eyes, she can feel the loving arms of Jesus around her saying, it's going to be okay. It can still be good with your soul. Ronnie's life may have been taken, but his soul was purchased on this cross. It was purchased on, on the cross. And so Johnny's going to lead us in a song. We're going to worship the Lord, and he's going to give us peace. Bye. 
fighting thoughts of fear Wondering why you called my name Am I good enough to share this cup? This world has left me lame And even in my weakness The Savior calls my name Right here in His presence I am healed and unashamed I'm carried to the table wants you to walk on the water of the waves. He wants you to stand in the fire and not be burnt. He's not asking you to do it by yourself, but he does have an assignment for you. So I wanna pray. If you receive God's assignment for you, this is the prayer I'm gonna lead you in. If you, if you mean it, you don't have to, but if you mean it, if you could put your hand on your heart and just repeat after me, dear Jesus, I receive my assignment. Lord's gonna empower you. You're gonna find yourself in the fire, but you're not gonna smell like smoke. You're not even gonna be touched by it. You're gonna find yourself in industries and in spaces where you don't belong. You're gonna find yourself being pushed out into storms. If you remember, the Lord gave Pastor Kevin a vision where it was like God was like happily like walking into the storm and he reached out and held Pastor Kevin's hand and, and like God was like all cheery. And Pastor Kevin's like, wait a minute, that looks like a storm. Lord gave our pastor that vision 
because it's a vision for our church. We are called to go to the very gates of hell and rescue people. We're called to be in places where we really don't belong in the world sense, but we're right where we're supposed to be in, in heaven sense. My prayer is that you can walk out with confidence saying, it's well with my soul. God's got my soul. I don't consult all these other things in the world because the Lord has given me peace, not as the world's given me peace, but the way he decides to give me peace. Dear Jesus, I pray that you, com that you empower us to be missionaries everywhere we go. Yeah, places like Libya and Afghanistan and North Korea, hard places, places where the church has never existed like Bhutan, Lord, places that are impossible, God, I pray that you send us, empower us to go and bring hope in the places where hope seems like it's extinct. But God, I also ask that you make us missionaries to our own homes. Give us the power to walk across the street. Give us the ability to empty bank accounts when we need to, to sell homes, to, to be New Testament Christians. Lord, I ask that our trust is fully in you. You proved yourself with the empty cross. Three days later, Lord, you rose again. You conquered sin and death. You already won. And God, I ask that we would be prepared for the victory that you have for us and for this church. In your holy and awesome name we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We'd love to stay connected with you throughout the week. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for additional content, including our after party at 3 p.m. We are so thankful for your generosity and continued support with missions and outreach. You can give easily and securely online by using the link in the stream. If today was your first day joining us, let us know. Either type new in the comments or use any of the links in the stream. Let's continue to pray, to love, and serve each other with passion. Let's go be the hope our world needs right now. See you soon.